Last time we started out playing a dice game, and the dice game, the idea is, is you roll a two dice, and it will tell you, uh, you get to pick whether you think it's going to be low, seven, or high. Low is designated as two through six, seven of course is seven, high is eight through twelve. You can wager, or you wager a certain amount on it, and if you pick a low or high, and it ends up being low or high, you win even money. If you pick seven, and it ends up being a seven, we, uh, you get paid four to one. And we analyze what the odds are, and the odds, of course, are against you, uh, but it's sort of important to have a sense of what the odds are when you're testing. Like, if you won every time, you probably, there's probably a bug in your program, all right? Whereas if you lost every time, there's probably a bug in your program as well. So let's go and open it up and see where we left off. Uh, I talked about a couple of ideas uh, more general to software development than this specific case. One of them is sort of when you look at the problem, sort of take a mental inventory of what you know and what you don't know, all right? So in this case, we drew a couple screens up there, and we said, well, we know how to create a drop-down, for example. We know how to create a button. We know how to associate code with a button. Um, we don't know how to, how to change an image, but we've changed other properties of other controls. So probably changing an image is going to be very similar to that. So... We didn't know exactly how to do it, but we weren't terribly intimidated. Uh, lastly, we didn't know how to uh, randomly generate a number, but we figured, well, okay, we could look that up. So we took inventory of the problem and said, what parts of the problem should be relatively straightforward because we've done it before? What parts of the problem might be a little bit harder because we haven't done anything exactly like that before, but we've done something similar? And finally, what is sort of the unknown, uncharted territory in the problem? Something that we've never done before. All right? I think it's a good idea to do that before you begin. Uh, I, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed when there's a particular aspect of the problem that you haven't done before and think that you're totally lost. Most often the times, you're not totally lost. Most often times, um, you may be totally lost about one aspect of it, but you kind of have an okay idea how to do the other stuff. So it's good to do that and, and think in those terms. That was one concept that I tried to talk about. And, and if I'm writing code for a project I'm working on or whatever, I go through the same process. All right. Now, the more experienced you are, the more things that you've done, but probably the bigger problems you'll have to solve. So there, there will always be a proportion of stuff you know how to do, stuff you have a pretty good idea, stuff you have you're clueless about, all right? And you'll just, you know, no matter if you've been programming for one year or for 100 years, you're going to have that same uh, continuum. The second thing I talked about is trying to do a piece of the program at once. Don't try to do the entire thing all at once, but break it down into pieces and try to get it working. And that's beneficial from any number of perspectives. From one perspective, uh, tracking errors is a lot easier. If I write uh, a function that has 50 lines of code in it, let's say, and it doesn't work, the problem could be really anywhere among those 50 lines. Just probabilistically, you know, each line, you know, if I look at a line, there's a 1 in 50 chance that it's probably the one that messed it up, right? Plus, it gets more complicated when you consider that maybe there's a couple lines that have a problem and so on. But if you only have three or four lines of code that you haven't tested yet, then if there's a problem, it's among those two or three lines of code. It's a lot easier to find. So if you do things a bit at a time, get it working, then go on to the next step. Well, it's not a guarantee. Um, if something stops working, you can kind of bet it's in the new code that you just added a minute ago. All right. So if I get the program working up to point A and then add some more stuff and it stops working, well, I can assume the problem is in one of the lines of code that I did since point A. Right? Again, 
I know there's exceptions to the rule. Sometimes there's problems that don't show themselves until later on in the process. But that's a, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty good assumption to base things on. All right? Uh, plus, just attitude-wise, you know, rather than leaving the day with nothing tangible completed, you leave the day with a part of your code working. All right? And it's like, well, I haven't done everything, but I did this part. All right? And I, I think that leads for a better attitude. Rather than having uh, a half dozen things sort of started, but none of them work, have one thing that, okay, it might be a small piece, but that piece is taken care of. All right? And I can go on to the next piece and so on. So that's also how I develop code uh, as well. And again, you know, I say this having come from you know, programming for a long time. And despite that, when I'm working on projects, and I work on projects from time to time, uh, I adopt this exact same strategy. I, I have in my mind what I know, what I don't know, what I sort of know, and I try to do just a little bit of time, and then at each step, add a little bit more. All right, so let's look at where we left off. We left off in this simply rolling and displaying the value of one dice. Here we go. I'm going to bring the high low game up on the desktop. And that indeed is the application root folder. So that's the folder that I'm opening when I go into Visual Studio. So into Visual Studio. I do like to make sure that Solution Explorer is shown so I can see my files. I run it. And start. I have a button that clicks play, that rolls the dice, and gives me the value of it. Okay. 
How did we do this? The GUI has a button that is tied to the button play click event. Remember, I mentioned this a few times and, and I, uh, I'd be willing to bet that a couple times this is going to happen per semester, probably both to me, but it might happen to someone that if this isn't there, then it doesn't matter what the code is. The code only gets executed if that link is established to between the on click event of that button and this function. Button play click. You notice here it says on click equals button play underscore click. Thing to remember is this is a server side method. So this will run under two conditions. This will run if that button's been clicked and the server is called. Now, in reality, that's only one condition because the button is a submit button. So when the button's clicked, the server is called and the button's clicked. So it will run whenever the button's clicked because it's automatically, as it is a submit button, will send a request to the server. My code then generates a random number or, uh, by first creating a random object, then generating the random number as a number between 1 and 7, where the bottom end is inclusive and the top end is not. So in reality, this will give me a value between 1 and 6, which is exactly what I need. Now, I'm going to set the image's URL, the image URL for that image control, to part of the, part of the file name is going to be hard-coded, part of it is going to be coming from elsewhere. In this case, it gives the image URL as equaling images slash D plus value which is, again, the value of the dice, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, plus a PNG. And if you look at my images folder, I have in there D1 through D6. So this little snippet of code pieces together the full file name of the image. Everything is in the images folder, so I start with images. Everything starts with a D. Then I have whatever the value of the dice is, so D1, D2, D3, depending on the value of the dice, that's the value I use, and then I add a PNG on the end. Questions about this? All right, let's go and make a pair of dice. And I can do that simply by putting a second image on the page. I'm going to call the second image, image dice 2. value 2 equals random 1 through 7. 1 is inclusive, 7 is not, so this will give me a value of 1 through 6. Then finally, the image dice 2 image URL equals the prefix, which is images slash D, plus the value of image 2 plus PNG. 
So I'll go and run that. Now when I click play, I get two dice. If I wanted to test to, to make sure that this seemed to be working properly, I might run, you know, tests and keep track of every number that gets called. All right? Because I shouldn't have snake eyes turning up every time. All right? Because if I did, that's a problem. I should have it according to the percentages that I would expect it to. So each dice... Each value of the, if each dice has about a one, in, has a one in six chance of coming up each time I roll. All right. Okay. So that was easy enough. Let's go and what do we have to do to make this work? Well, we have to add a drop down where the user can select whether they pick high or low. All right. Or seven. So I'm going to go to the drop down. I'm going to go to the page, rather, add a drop-down. Notice at this point I'm not really paying attention to the appearance. You can, this is sort of like web development in the, in the fact that you can do it any way that makes sense to you. I could do a little bit of HTML, do a little bit of CSS, do a little bit of HTML, do a little bit of CSS. Or sort of do like I'm doing, where I'm creating the web page uh, and I'm putting the content out there via ASP.NET controls and working on the behavior via the C-sharp code, then I'm going to go back later and, and handle the uh, appearance of, of it. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to put in here four values, all right, because I don't want there to be a default. So I'm going to put in four values, and the first value is going to be enter or, or make selection. And the value for that, well, I could leave it at make selection if I want. All right. I'm going to add another one, and it's going to be low. Two through six. And I'll make the value for that simply low. Remember, the text and the value serve two different purposes. The text is what the user is going to see. The value is what the script is going to see. Add another one. Seven. Let's make the value seven. Add another one. I. Eight to twelve. Just say hi for that. So now we have this. And again, writing a little bit, testing a little bit. Not doing any evaluation to see if they were right or not. I'm just running the code. Now, the way it's written now, if, if I have make selection and hit play, it still plays. It should give a validation error. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to write a validation control. I had a couple of people ask me, would it be better for me to write my own if-else or uh, to use a build-in validation? Generally, it's better to use a build-in validation because those have been tested very thoroughly. I know you can all write if statements. You have a chance to write if statements in this class. Uh, but why reinvent the wheel? There's already a, a control that does the validation for you. And what's more, it does the validation client side or server side. It does it both. So if someone has disabled their JavaScript, um, it will do the validation server side. But if someone has their JavaScript enabled, it will do it client side. All right, so it's a win-win situation. Um, using the pre-written validator that does this doesn't mean that you're a weak coder or whatever. It means that you're a smart coder because you're using the components in the framework correctly. All right, let's go and add a required field validator here. I kind of put it in 
the wrong place. I sometimes have problems positioning it that way, so I'll just go to the code view. Put it here. Now if I go back there, it's where I want it to be. I can go change some of those properties, click on it. I can make the error message be must make a selection. Control to validate. I can choose the drop down because that's what I'm validating. I probably should, so I'm not too hypocritical, change the name of this drop down from the default drop down list one to something meaningful, DD selection. And I'll be sure I do that here too. So now we run it. We're a little further along the road. If I don't make a selection, it gives me an error. It gives me an error I didn't expect. All right. Uh, this again relates to a quirk about the way that uh, Visual Studio installs itself if you take the defaults. Uh, I would call this a bug in Visual Studio. Um, other people might have a different opinion. There's an easy fix though. If you put validation controls in your code, um, you can simply copy a value from my web config file from the previous example into your uh, web config file. And what you need to uh, copy is these app settings line here. So I'm going to go put that in my web config file. And run it. And I'll be all set. Hmm. Why isn't that working? Yes. Uh, should it be in a, uh, one of the methods in uh, the, uh, the CS file? No. That's what I was. That's what I was speaking before. You could do that, but it's better to use the pre-written control to do that. I forgot a step was that you need to do. Um, uh, protected void setting in the um, public partial class section. No, we're, we're not going to, we don't need to put, if we were writing our validation manually, we would put the code in there. But we're going to use a component here, so we don't need to, to do that. There, there's a, a validation settings, um, uh, a validation setting that online they recommend to put it in there to get rid of that code also. I don't know if it's... Okay. Yeah, it works for me, but I didn't okay. do that. So. Well, we, we, could, we could take a look at it in lab. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure what you mean. Um, there is something that I'm going to recommend that you put in your code later on. I don't know if it's the same thing or something else. All right. The problem is, is a drop-down is never empty, right? A drop-down always has an option. We have to explain to the validation control what represents the null option. So we do that in our validation control by saying... initial value equals, and we put in the, val the, the value of the dummy item. Now the dummy item's value is what? It's make selection. How do I know that? Because if I look at this and look at the items, the first item, the value of it is make selection. So for our validation control to work, since the dropdown always has a value, always has some value, we have to define what the dummy value is. And in our case, the dummy value is the value make selection. 
Now when we run this, the validation will work. Okay, yes? Um, so what happens if you don't, like, can you try, like, doing it so it works and then selecting that again? Yeah, so, like, it was showing up even if you didn't hit the button. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. That's the default behavior. Um, I would I would say that's okay. Definitely at this point of the course, it's okay to do that. It doesn't like that because remember that this code happens client side. Therefore, it doesn't have to make it back to the server to do the checking. You you sort of have three choices when you are using ASP.NET components. All right, writing ASP.NET page. You can either sort of go with the flow and just take the default behavior and say, okay, the default behavior works for me. That's what I'm going to do. You can take and you can custom code a piece of it and change the default behavior to work a different way. And sometimes if the default behavior is something that you don't really like, you might want to do that. Finally, there's sort of the all bets are off, and you absolutely hate the way that the ASP.NET control does it, in which case you write your own custom code to do it. So there's an occasion to do all of those things, to either let the default do what it does, write some code to tweak the default behavior, or forget the control altogether and write your own code for it. Okay. So now we have our validation working. The last thing we really have to do is actually play the game and display the results. So I'm going to put a label on here. And I'm going to call it LBL results. And initially, it has no value. Then I'm going to have some if statements. And I'm going to compare the sum of the dice with what the user had chosen. So I'm going to create an int sum of dice equals value 1 plus value 2. If the user's choice is low, and it's less than 7, then they won. Less than seven. So what's the user's choice? Well, it's in a drop-down called Selection. And I have three properties that it could be. two properties that it could be. I could use selected index or I could use selected value. I generally use selected value just in case someone rearranges the user interface. Right now the, the drop down is in order from low, seven, high. Someone might come around and say I want it to be high, seven, low or something like that. zero, the second item is one, the third item is two, the fourth item is three. Now in this case, the dummy item is, is zero, so the thing with an index of one corresponds to low. The thing with an index of two corresponds to seven, 
and the item with an index of four, three rather, corresponds to high. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to look at the value itself. And I'm going to say if the selected value equals low, then if sum of dice is less than 7, then we've won. And I want to set label results, text equals that they're a winner. Otherwise, they have lost. And I'm going to clone this because the other two options are going to be coded really about the same. So if DD selection is equal to 7, so if I've chosen it at 7 and the sum of the dice is in fact 7, then they've won. Finally, if the selected value is high and the value is greater than 7, then they're a winner. So I go and run this. I'm going to pick low, play, I won. Seven, play, I lost. Keep it at seven and play, I lost again. Okay. Questions over any of this? doing similar to what we did before. We're using the controls on the page. We're getting their values. We're having if statements to determine whether they've won, lost, or tied. Now, could you write these if statements differently? Sure. All right. But this works. This makes sense to me. It's readable. That's sort of the criteria. There's some school of thought that tries to shave every millisecond from the compiler and from the, the server and all that. I generally am not too worried about that. Um, I just want to make sure the code is readable and understandable. Questions about this? Now again, I'm going to what am I going to do? I'm going to talk about debugger for a second. I'll show you the mistake I'm going to make. That should be value 1 plus value 2 says value 1 plus value 1. All right. Let's run this and let's see how it acts. Because it's not going to be correct, right? Interesting thing, it's going to be correct some of the time. Right? Because if, if value 1 was a 3 and value 2 was a 3, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to work, right? Because coincidentally it worked out. Or value 2 is a 1. You add 3 and 1, you're supposed to get a 4. Well, if you add 3 and 3, you get 6. Well, 6 is also low. So, 
This won't blow up every single time. This won't be an error every single time. It will just be an error some of the time. Which again, that's generally the hardest kind of thing, problem to debug, is when it's not wrong all the time, but it's wrong some of the time. So let's run this and see what we have. Let's say I pick low, play, says I'm a winner when I shouldn't be, all right? Because it didn't add two and six together, it added two and two together. It says I'm a winner there. We're not supposed to be a winner there, right? Because coincidentally, five and four gives me a value above eight, so does five and five. Tells me I lost, but I should have lost, right? So the funny thing is, it's two out of three times it's giving me correct results, all right? All right, two out of four times it gives me correct results. The point is, is that you need thorough testing. All right. If I were to run this through once and see, I'm liable to think that it worked. Or if I ran it through a couple times, I'm liable to think that it worked. You need to test it thoroughly. When there's randomness involved, again, it's especially troublesome because it's coming up with values randomly and you may have to run a bunch of tests to test all the scenarios. How many scenarios do you think you would want to test? How many scenarios do you think you would want to try for this to work, for, for you to verify it? That's a, good, that's a good question for today. How many, how many tests should you run? What are the conditions that you should look for to know that you've thoroughly tested it? Think about that for two minutes. How would you thoroughly test this to make sure that it was working? Feel free to talk among yourselves. Put in that console. Pardon me? Developer tools console. Is that what it is? I can't remember. Um, we're going to run it through debugger at some point. Oh, so so that, that, will, that will allow us. The developer's tool console, I think, is more... Uh, important when you're uh, debugging stuff on the client side. I guess what I'm saying is what different scenarios do I want to make sure works? How do I know that this works? So a scenario of possibility? All the possibilities. Oh. All the possibilities I want to test. I think there are 27 possibilities I want to test. All right. Let's see. Let's 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 put my thoughts up on the board and we'll see if it looks good or not. I want to pick. I want to I want to make sure I test. That Spreadsheet like this. A little scorecard. I pick low, and the roll is low. I should win. Did I win? I picked low, and the computer rolled seven. I would expect to lose. Did I lose? I rolled seven. I said 27. I think I meant nine. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, three times three. I rolled low. 
All right, pick low. Rolled high. What's the actual result? And what's the expected result? I would expect to lose. Does this chart make sense to everyone? All right. If I pick low, I should only expect to win if I actually roll low. If I roll a seven or roll a high, I should expect to lose. Now, if I pick a seven and I roll a low, I'd expect to lose. If I roll a seven and I, if I pick a seven and I roll a seven, I'd expect to win. If I pick seven and roll a high, I'd expect to lose. Now, where did I come up with 27? This is nine. Finally, high. If I pick high and there's low, I'd expect to lose. If I pick high and it's a seven, I'd expect to lose. If I pick high and it's high, I'd expect to win. So, does the results match up? Um, yeah. You know, if it matched up, then I could be pretty sure that it was correct. If it didn't match up, then I'd be pretty sure that it was, that there might be a problem. This is further complicated, right? Because this depends on that the computer is scoring a, 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 a high the right value and a low the right value, all right? Because if we noticed before, in some of the cases, I was getting my expected result, just not all of them. So with randomness, you might want to test even more than this. I might want to run through the cycle a couple times to make sure that it worked. All right. Um, when randomness is involved, again, that, that, that sort of throws a monkey wrench in the testing. Sometimes you can write code to sort of rig the results, but that's not really testing the code then, all right? Uh, and there can be problems doing that. So at any rate, if I had this in my mind, notice a couple occasions we got results different than we expected, all right? But for you to really test this, you should run at least through these scenarios at least once, probably a couple of times just due to the randomness. So, we find that there is something wrong. How do we test this? Well, again, one of our options is to stare at the code until the problem jumps up and slaps us in the face. All right? That's probably not the best technique to use. It's better to use a systematic approach. And again, sort of the x-ray into the code is debug mode. Where we can go in and we can set a breakpoint like that. And we can run the code until it hits that point, And then we can look and see exactly what's going on. All right. Now, in this case, I would hope that I caught the, I would catch the problem easily because, you know, there's only a handful of instructions in this code. But if you didn't, you could always run it through the debugger. So let's run through the debugger. I'm going to pick low and play. It's at that point. I can then step through. So I'm going to use F11 to step into. Step into means it's going to go and actually execute that line of code and show us the results. So, I'm now on that line of code. I'm now on that line, that line, that line. If I put my mouse over a variable, it shows me the value of that variable. Value 2 has a value of 5. Value 1 has a value of 2. 
So I should have rolled a seven. Sum of dice will show me the value before the instruction has been executed. So always remember when you hover over the item, it shows you the value before the item has been executed. All right? So if I look at sum of dice and say, oh, that's zero, well, that instruction hasn't executed yet. So that really doesn't show anything. If I F11, though, and look, sum of dice, it shows down here as four is red, meaning it was recently updated by the last instruction, and value 2 and, f and 5, value, value uh, 1 is 2, value 2 is 5, the sum should be 7, and yet it's showing us 4. So I know there's a problem in getting the sum. All right? There could be other problems with this too, right? Maybe I spelled low wrong. Maybe I spelled... Wow, it's kind of hard to spell seven wrong. I guess I could write out the word seven instead of having a number of seven, or I could spell high wrong. But at any point, I can actually see the flow of code. So at this point, I've picked low, all right, and it should be a value of seven, and yet it's going to tell me that I want. <coughs> As I hit F11, it shows me the actual path of instructions that it goes through. When I reach the end, I can just go up to debug and say continue. Or rather, not continue, yeah, continue. And I picked low, 2 to 6, and I rolled a 7 and it says I'm a winner. If something you do doesn't work, that will probably be one of the first things I'll ask you, uh, if you ask me to, to help you out, is what did the debug show you? All right? It's not that I'm giving you a hard time, so why I want to cultivate sort of the systematic approach. Because simply staring at the code and waiting for the problem to jump out at you doesn't work. So use some systematic way, and the debugger is, you know, a, a very good tool for systematically looking at your code and figuring out what's wrong. And then we could go in and correct it, and it should work again. I encourage you to test your program very thoroughly and to test it in a systematic way. I keep using the word systematic today. Uh, You know, writing code is, is nothing if not systematic, right? I mean, you're writing instructions for a machine. Therefore, you need to break down what needs to be done in a very clear and logical way for the machine to do. And you have, you have to have your problem-solving skills to think through the problem and do that. So systematic is a good quality for a programmer to, to have, all right? Don't forget about it when you go to test, though, and debug. All right. I've known people that were pretty good programmers that just never got really the hang of systematically testing. And what they would do is their, what, their way of testing would be to run it through a few tests and just look at the results. Like, oh, okay, I picked low. Okay, that's right. Okay, that's right. The program must work. All right. Most bugs aren't that obvious. Most bugs aren't bugs that happen all the time. There's some of them, right? You just, you just made a mistake or whatever. But most of the bugs that, are, uh, that, that slip through testing are the bugs that are very situational, that depend on a certain characteristic for the error to show itself and to make itself known. All right. Um, you know, payroll applications might calculate the payroll for 95% of the company correctly, right? But if you meet certain conditions, like you're single head of household with three dependents, blah, 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 it doesn't work, all right? That's why a systematic approach to testing 
is needed so that you can, as well as you possibly can, catch all the possibilities and get them working before you release something that contains bugs. Um, collectively, as an industry, we could do better testing our software than, than what I've seen in the past. You know, could you imagine, you know, you know, you really want the number of errors to be very, very low. You don't want them to be where, you know, well, it works most of the time, or it works except under these conditions. That is the, the mark of, a, of a, a program that isn't particularly good. All right? Questions about any of this? All right, let's talk about styling this. How are we going to style this? All right? Let's sketch what we want this to look like. Okay? Let's draw what we want this to look like. Okay. Um, maybe we want to do something like this. And again, drawing is always a good thing for our code. Because again, I mentioned that what I demonstrate in class is largely from a coding perspective. I don't want you to turn in something as bare bones as like I did right there. All right. Uh, so for uh, in many cases, that's what we're going to do in class because I expect you to take the time to correct it. But I do want to go through a few examples of like how you might finish this up. So how I might finish this up if this was an assignment and I was in this class, I might want to make my page to look like this. First of all, I'm going to center a box on my page. And I'm going to have high, low, gain. Maybe I'll give a nice background of this. I'll have an explanation of how the game works. I'll have the drop down here and the error message next to it. Of the button underneath. Two dice. And then something saying if you won or lost. But I want that to be big. different, but I am dotting the I's and crossing the T's. I'm spending a little effort to make it look good rather than simply um, rather than simply just, you know, um, you know, just turning in a really bare bones, only the code. giving me a div, that doesn't mean I have to keep it, right? I can certainly get rid of that. I can do anything I can do to a regular HTML file. And what I'm going to do here is to get rid of the div, the form. I actually need the form tag in there, all right? So I'm going to keep the form tag in there, and I'm going to use it as a style element. So I'm going to say form.
with 500 pixels, or I'll do something like this, with 50%, min width, 300 pixels, let's say. Margin, 0px, auto. Actually, we'll make this 50px auto. What's this going to do for me? It's going to effectively center it, right? Because with 50%, with a minimum width of 300 pixels, we'll make it 50% of the available space, but no smaller than 300 pixels. The margin is, I, think I thought I said I wanted 50 pixels. 50 pixels on the top and bottom. Remember, top, right, bottom, left. I saw in the one book that I was looking at the other day that a way to remember that, if you can't remember it, is trouble. Top, right, bottom, left, trouble. If you're a Star Trek fan, triple. All right, that would work as well. Uh, it's easy. I, I've never had a problem remembering it because it's like clock, you know, uh, uh, clockwise. Top, right, bottom, left. For good measure, I'm going to put a border around it too. And it's not going to work. Why not? Because I didn't apply that style sheet to my page. Copy the source. I'll put a link in here to say where I got the image from.
and in my CSS file, refresh here. CSS and say for the body background URL images slash gigantic picture. I'm going to make a smaller version of it. So a bunch of ways that you can do this. Any Windows machine I know has paint, so I'm going to go and do that. Uh, I'm going to go, and I have no idea how to use this new version of paint. Um, Size it. Let's make it thousand pixels wide. Then we'll save it and probably need to give this a background of white. So I'll give my form a background of white. I'm going to give it a height of four hundred pixels. aligned right. Uh, a good way to do that is with an unordered list. So I can put, because really a form is simply an unordered list of items. So I can create an unordered list. I can put the drop down and required field validator in one list item. I 
results in a fourth. And my credits and a last. Okay, kind of did what I wanted to do. I think I said I wanted it centered. So what I can do, and I want to probably get rid of the bullet points. Uh, so I will go in and do that via CSS. So I will say UL list style type none li text align center I can put my heading up here I could put the instructions here which I won't write out but you get the idea. And now we have a layout that I would still tweak if I was doing this for real, but not bad for 10 minutes extra work. All right. And this is what I mean about like I don't even know if I'm asking you to go the extra mile. I might be asking you to go the extra 100 yards. All right? Spend enough time to polish it up and make it look more like a finished web page. The focus of this class is on scripting, is on programming, but this is a good opportunity for you to play with some of the other stuff that you're working on, uh, that, that you've learned. All right? I would add padding probably to the headings. I might change the font. Uh, I would space things out a little bit. Maybe if I wanted to, I'd put uh, some transparency so the image peeked out from underneath there and so on. The point is, is with just a little bit extra work, you can make a page that looks a lot better. And again, it, it, it move you uh, from just creating something that's adequate to creating something that's really good. <coughs> All right, questions about this? Yes? Um, you always type out your CSS. Can you click and drag it from the um, properties or the solution or whatever it's called? Um, let's see. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't see no, anything. No, no, that's not where it's part in the um, HTML part. Yeah, you see, I've got your style sheet. Can you go over to the style sheet and the solutions and click and drag that icon onto that? No, where do you see? Style sheets. On the other side. Solutions and the solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Style sheet? Click and drag it onto the. I guess. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Uh, I just noticed you typed it out. I thought maybe that was a reason. No. Oh. Just, you know, once you, uh, you know, once you've typed it out so many times, it's not that huge of a deal. Right. So, you know, whatever works. Um, it seemed like it was missing one of the three attributes it needs because it only put two. But, I, I mean, I guess it would work. But sure. Just like, you know, instead of me... That's why, because it looked different. That's why yeah. Instead of, like, putting in these fields, you could also, you could do the same thing here. Like, I um, typed in a link, for example. I could drag over a hyperlink control like that, too. So, yeah. It's just a case of, since I'm, you know, I'm, I'm used to typing, I just, I just type it in. But, yeah, you're certainly welcome to drag and drop... Uh, Provide you know you know what all's going on with that. All right. Uh, the
questions. I'll go unlock the lab, then I'll come back here to grab my files, and I'll be back in lab.